In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, last week we began a journey together through the Divine Liturgy. We touched on how the Divine Liturgy calls us to be active participants, and about how notions of sacrifice and thanksgiving are central uh, to the liturgy. Today as we can we continue our journey by actually taking a step backwards and discussing about how we can better prepare ourselves to participate in this great event that is the liturgy. And we offer this in, in, in the sense not as a list of, of, of rules or guidance, but as the, as the letter kills and the spirit gives life, we offer this as ways to enter and prepare ourselves to meet, uh, to meet our Lord in the liturgy. After all, the divine liturgy is itself the kingdom of God come with power. It is the kingdom of God already at hand. And so if we desire to really enter into this reality as the body of Christ, as I'm sure we all do, the question arises, how can I prepare myself? How can I prepare myself? And the first thing, I think the first most important point, is to realize that we do need to prepare ourselves. We, and this is where we can make analogies to other things. You know, if I, if I want to learn another language, for example, I just can't start suddenly trying to expect myself to be fluent the next day. Or if I'm trying to learn an, learn an is, is instrument, right, I just can't pick up the, the, the violin, John, I, know, I just can't pick up the violin and start playing Bach beautifully, right? It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of effort. Um, the, the same way you think of the preparation when you're, when you're studying in school for students, you're preparing for an exam. And it's, of course, not to think we should never think of literature like an exam or competition, far from it. But we know that in other areas of our life, how important it is to prepare, uh, to prepare. And in an analogous way, it's the same way for our experience of the liturgy. Now, why is this? Why is this? I think we'd say that if, if we had perfect remembrance of God and unceasing prayer, if we were able to be like some of the saints, whether in a crowd of people or alone by ourselves, remembering God perfectly at all times with that deep prayer in our hearts, we wouldn't need such special preparation for the liturgy. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that most of us are far from that state of being. It is, in fact, we know that the world out there lives to, moves to a very different rhythm. It dances to the beat of a different drum. It's a whole different way, way of life. And for us, it's difficult to make, that, um, to make that transition sometimes. And so we have to consciously prepare ourselves to, as we hear, we'll soon hear in the shadow of Kim, to lay aside all earthly cares that we may receive the King of all. I remember this feeling, just as another, another example, um, particularly the evening service. Before I was a priest, I used to come from work sometimes, which many of you could relate, and you've had this busy day of work with all these things you're thinking about, and then you come and you, and you fight through the traffic, maybe you've had the radio on too, and then you come into the service, and it's almost as if you can't, and perhaps it's already started, you're a couple minutes late, it's almost as if you can't hear the prayers at first all the thoughts that are rushing through, that it takes, perhaps we can take 10 minutes or more before we can start to really calm our mind to begin to enter in the experience of prayer. But nonetheless, little by little, little by little, if we stick with it, it does take place. And with the liturgy, with the morning service, I think it's, it's much more possible to, to prepare our, our, ourselves. And we'll talk about why that's, um, why, that, that, why that's important. But we know how much this other stuff, how difficult it is to make that transition at times. And you know, a second step, that's important, uh, that's really so important, it's just to cultivate that desire for our Lord, the desire to meet Him. As we heard in the, in the Gospel today, that desire to take up our cross and follow Him, to love our Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this is really, you could say, the preparation that we can do every day, throughout the week, throughout any time, is to cultivate that desire to meet God, to remember Him, to encounter Him. We recognize that Jesus Christ is the source of our life. He is our hope and our joy. And that we have that desire to thirst, to drink from the fountain of living water. Uh, if we thirst for Him. And so we cultivate, we cultivate this desire within ourselves. And the third step, uh, in a more practical way, is to realize that our preparation begins even before Sunday morning. And in fact, liturgically, we know that it begins on Saturday evening. Um, it's, it's customary, if, if at all possible, to pray at the Great Vespers or the Vigil on the Eve of the Divine Liturgies or the Great Feasts. Because we know within the hymnography, it's not a separate service, it's not, but it's one continuous service. It begins the cycle of that celebration. 
So last night at Vespers, we're all, we're already singing hymns of the resurrection. We're beginning to prepare ourselves. We're remembering the martyrs, faith, hope, and love who we remember today. We're beginning to, to enter into that. So we're already beginning to prepare our hearts for what will culminate, what will culminate in the divine liturgy. You know, the church follows biblical time. We read in Genesis that it was evening and it was morning one day. And so as the church counts time liturgically, we already see the, the evening before as that as, as that uh, is already beginning uh, to enter into that event. And so in our preparation, it's important, especially if we're preparing to receive communion the next day, not to spend the day before, we'd say, in worldly excess and drinking, revelry, or just some things that are kind of out of keeping with that, uh, but to prepare our hearts for this miracle, this miracle that will take place the next day that we'll get to encounter. And we say we know the world lives into a different drummer, and if in any case we're not there, we still, we still try to come to church, but nonetheless, we want to really try to enter into that experience. This is why we begin already on the eve to quiet our hearts, to enter into that prayer, and to begin to prepare ourselves, especially as we say on days when we're preparing for Holy Communion. So the fourth step, the fourth step is to to confess our sins, to confess our sins. Whether sacramentally, uh, which is something that we should do regularly, though not necessarily every week, uh, but at least every time to confess to the Lord in our hearts. And why is this? Why is this? Uh, it's, it's so that we can, in a sense, be in the right state of mind to re- meet our Lord, who is so merciful, so loving. It cultivates within us a sense of gratitude, a sense of awe. We recognize that we are and never worthy to be here, to be taken such worship. And yet, nonetheless, the God loves us so profoundly, so deeply, more than we can ever know. It's this paradox, if you will, that's always there, as we say, with the fear of God, and yet with faith and love, draw near. We have these beautiful pre-communion prayers, and those who are preparing, it's important not to neglect, whether you pray them on Saturday, or on Sunday morning, or elsewhere. But with all of them, it has the sense of preparing our hearts, the confession of the confession on one hand, of recognizing my shortcomings, my, my, my failures, but nonetheless confessing my faith in God and His mercy, confessing that this is the center of my life, that He is the center of my being. And so we, we, practice, we practice this act of confession. And I encourage just to, as a, for the participating in sacramental confession, uh, Saturday evening is usually the best time. It's not, it's not rushed, it's quieter, it's part of our preparation. And for Sunday mornings, often be more reserved for those who live farther away, for health reasons otherwise maybe can't make the long distance, but certainly can go throughout the week at other times. But, but nonetheless, we, 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 we recognize that sense of, of our unworthiness, and that is the very thing that makes us worthy, to receive Holy Communion, to enter into the worship. It's the paradox. I'm unworthy, O Lord, and that recognition uh, makes me worthy to receive His mercy and His grace, not according to my own efforts. And the fifth one, one is, again, something very important, to strive to be at peace, to be at peace with all people. We remember our Lord's words that if we desire to offer a gift before the altar, remember that our brother or sister has something against us. We're first to leave our gift aside, he says, and to go strive to be reconciled. I think St. Paul puts this very beautifully, said, as much as it is in your power, strive to be at peace with all people. Remembering that it's not always within our power, but have we taken that effort? Have we made that? Have we taken those steps to try to make that effort? In the pre-service book, um, you know, this is something that I think is worth sharing. We have this service book, and before you get to open up the very beginning, before you serve the liturgy, that's just something very striking, which I think is, is applicable to all of us as well. It says the following, The priest who would celebrate the divine mysteries must first be at peace with all, bearing no ill will for anyone. And I think, as I say, this is something that we could, that is an admonition that's for all of us. And we ask ourselves, uh, we ask forgiveness of our family members if we need to. We, if we have to pick up the phone and call somebody if we've offended. And listen to, listen to your heart this way. I mean, by being at peace, it allows us to not come burdened, weighed down, but that our hearts may be light and free to receive the grace, the grace that is here. And the sixth aspect is that we do, we do pray. The prayer is so important. You know, it, is, it was said, and I believe truly, that we want to deepen our experience of the prayer and the liturgy to deepen our prayer at home and see in our private prayer. And, by, and, and likewise, the other way, to deepen our private prayer, we should deepen our, our experience of liturgical worship. 
the Lord speaks of two different types of prayers. He says, when you pray, go into your, 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 your closet, right, and pray to your Father who's in the secret place, and He who, who sees you in secret will reward you openly. We have this. We also are told by our Lord that when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. As Christians, we have both of these. The one representing our, our, our private prayers before the Lord in secret, and the other which is this, the two or three, or two or three hundred, whatever, a gathered together where Christ is in the midst. And we need, and we need both of these, both of these aspects. And I say as paradoxically as it seems, we say sometimes, if I'm, I'm struggling with my prayer in the liturgy. We can sometimes, we struggle a little bit more in our prayer at home to make that space to be with Him, but then it can, they, they mutually build each other up. They mutually build each other up. And so I encourage all, all of you to, to really um, enter into that as well. You're, you're here today, which is wonderful. And we take this experience home to our, to our private prayers, our daily prayers. And then likewise, through that, we bring that experience of prayer, that quietness, that peace, with us to the liturgy. And finally, uh, finally um, the last aspect I want to highlight is that from the moment we wake up on Sunday morning, the morning of the, or the morning of the liturgy, all of our thoughts are directed toward God, toward the Holy Chalice, especially if we're going to commune, toward the, Holy, toward the Kingdom of God. We guard our words and our thoughts carefully. We try to avoid any conflicts with other people, any unnecessary conversations. There will be time to, to, to talk about all of that later. But the idea is that our thought, our focus, from the very beginning, is on our Lord, is on that encounter. And I'm going to continue, continue reading from the service book as it, as it goes on, the admonition to the priest who's serving, which, again, I think applies to all of us. It says that the priest must guard his heart as far as he is able and remain abstinent from the evening before and be vigilant until the divine service begins. Of course, remain vigilant even after the service begins. But this is, but this is the idea that we're especially, our focus isn't on other things. All, all of that can wait. It will still be there after, after liturgy, after the dismissal. But if we want to really enter into this, this becomes, uh, this becomes where our heart is, is yearning, where our heart is, 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 is hungry. And this is the tradition, the reason behind the fast, the pre-communion fast, so that our hunger is directed toward God. Our, our attention is directed toward God. Uh, the heavenly banquet in the time that we arise, so that our very first taste of anything will be of the Holy Eucharist. And for those who don't have medical reasons and necessitate some relaxation of this, and the Church understands uh, these things, that we can get a, have a blessing for if it's really needed, but our tradition to understand is to refrain from eating or drinking until after we receive Holy Communion on the day that we are, are the day of the liturgy, so that our desire is entirely directed toward God from the moment we wake up Sunday morning. I think it's something interesting, even within the English language, perhaps, that kind of carries through this, that breakfast is the meal where you break the fast, you know, that comes, comes after, uh, after that we, we have this, that our hunger is not just for the food that passes away, but our hunger for the kingdom on those days, uh, on the days of the liturgy. And so we try to shut out the worldly noise, the gossip, anything that can lead to sinful thoughts or distractions. For those who are driving longer distances, there's more than one of you in the car, perhaps one person could read, could read prayers. It's a very beautiful thing to do. Or you need to put on like a CD, even a CD of hymns, the hymns of the church or of prayers. But as much as we can, we try to avoid the, the news or worldly music, um, unnecessary conversations, politics, anything that's going to begin to stir up our heart with other thoughts to kind of solely our attention to the one thing needful. And I think you know, and if you have know, experienced this, how difficult it is, as it is to keep our thoughts where they need to be, to keep our thoughts focused deeply, as we talked about last week, on the words of the prayer, letting them enter in. And the more, if, if, we, if we know this from experience, the more that we start to have other things enter into our mind, all these other cares, the more kind of stimuli that come in before the liturgy, the harder it is. We're already kind of fighting it, we're fighting up uphill battle in that sense. And then, so, just to end with another analogy, which some of you may have experienced perhaps, where if your loved one, you kind of loved one, perhaps a husband or wife who's been away for a long time, and you're going to meet them again to go to the airport to meet them, or a long, or old friend perhaps, someone you haven't seen in months or years, is coming back and you're going to get to meet them that day. I think you can, can, can understand that you're on that day that you are to meet them, how much your thought is directed toward that, how exciting it is, how much it, how much it fills you up, and how 
we just realize that, that we have this tremendous joy experience to encounter God right here in the liturgy, the King of Heaven, to encounter our Lord Jesus Christ, and how our thought and our expectation can be to that. And I find inspiration too uh, with some of the with some of the younger ones, our kids sometimes, and we know that, that excitement of being able to go. Do we go to go to church today to receive Holy Communion? And this is that sense in our heart to build that expectation, not expectation just in the name sense, but to build that des- that that desire, that yearning, uh, that focus toward the kingdom. And so, brothers and sisters, not that we, uh, again, not, never to view this as, as some kind of straitjacket with this, but it's an invitation to enter deep, more deeply, more deeply. And so I'd encourage all of us as we go forth, uh, as we go forth and we, we continue to reflect on the liturgy, to try to make just a little bit more, more of an effort in some way that's been offered, to prepare ourselves, to prepare our hearts for this tremendous miracle, this miracle that is the liturgy. And that we may love and worship the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to whom be all glory, honor, and worship, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.